you have 77 counties in Oklahoma, I can put reports in them in 66 counties. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? I'd say it was a person or somebody really big. But he's all in black. Welcome back to Squatch Ranger Files, Episode 4. I want to go over the show's format with you for some people who might be unfamiliar with how I'm doing things. So, what we have set up is I have an email address, squatchranger at gmail.com. Anyone who has had an encounter from the Oklahoma area can send me their encounter story. I would like the year, the county, and a description of what happened in your encounter. What you were doing that day, what led up to the event of your sighting, and how did you feel when it happened? Some people don't feel like typing out their stories. So, I've also opened it up another way. You can also call me on the phone, or I can call you, and record your story, and I will type it out for you. That has been working out successfully as well. Let's move on, and here's the show. Number 1. Lots of whoops on family property. This happened 2011 through the present in McIntosh County. I actually called the BFRO when I heard three communicating with each other over at Twin Mountains. It was about 2 a.m. I just got back from the casino and had my window up. Laying there, I heard one and then three whoops on the hill behind my house and one answered down in our pasture with two whoops. The original whoop was heard again three times, and another whoop responded from another location with even more whoops. My brother had his own encounter, but he won't say it was Bigfoot. I know it was. And my dad heard the one while hunting. Yes, all this occurred on family land. My brother had stones thrown at him in the same place we camped when we were younger. He said nobody he knew could throw them, but yet he doesn't know what it was. That's the same place where there were trees. I wish I would have recorded them the night they were communicating. I got up and got my phone, but it happened so quick they never whooped again after that series. I believe that one was a family. The two that answered back wasn't as deep as the main one. I played some recorded whoops I found on the internet for my dad. I had it ready before he imitated what it sounded like. I told him, okay, I'm going to play this sound after you tell me what you heard sounded like. Because we have had some people there not believing. Dad whooped and then I played the clip The people were like, wow. When I first heard them, he was faint, and I thought they were geese. Then I could hear something walking through the woods down below me. I couldn't see who it was, but it sounded like very heavy walking. I thought at first it was a hunter walking loud, and I thought, that guy is wasting his time trying to walk with all those leaves. I thought it was a hunter walking just inside the high line, trying to catch a deer out in the opening. That's about the time he whooped again, and I thought, that's him. This was a different whoop than I heard before, but I knew that's what it was. I went home that night and started listening to the BFRO recordings and found it, and that's when I played it for my dad a few days later. Number 2. Seven-year-old sees eight-foot-tall creature covered in hair. 1957 in St. Francois, Missouri. Well, another day done, home from school, and homework done. 
I think I'll go watch some TV with my cousins. They're only 100 yards away, so it's good as long as I'm home by dark. I'm only seven years old. We cut up a while and watch TV a while. Then my uncle says it's time to get home. Okay, I head out, it's dusk. I walk a bit, play a bit. It's all part of our biggest backyard in St. Francois County. I start along the gravel driveway. I pick up a stick and start tossing up rocks to pass the time along my journey to home. Then, before I cross the gravel county road between our homes, I glance down the road and see something I've never seen before. A big, dark, hairy animal walking across the road, maybe 80 total yards away. It stops. It looks at me. It lets out a sound like a snort. I turn, ran back to my cousin's house in total fear, screaming, A bear! A bear! I saw a bear and it was eight foot tall. It growled at me. Darkness has fallen, so my uncle grabs a gun and gives my cousin a flashlight. We make our way across the path to my home. I am totally in hysterics. My dad tries to calm me and questions me as to what is happening. I commence to explain it the best possible way a seven-year-old can. So I explain. I saw a bear. It was eight feet tall. It was all hair walking across the road. It stopped walking and looked at me. Then it snorted at me and walked off when I screamed and ran back. They brought me home. Later in the evening, they never saw a thing. I was scared to death of the dark for at least another ten years. By then, I felt secure carting a gun. If I wasn't sure, I'd be in by dark. I haven't seen it since. I spent lots of time trying to explain. It was eight feet tall, all covered with hair, walking on two legs, and it made a snorting sound at me. So the only excuse my dad could come up with was, you had to have seen a horse. No, I'm a farm boy. I know a horse when I see one. I had never heard of Bigfoot before. My only analysis was a bear. Remember, I was seven years old. The following is a BFRO investigative report. Number 3 Rural Family's Dog Chases Young Sasquatch 1997 in Payne County My family and I arrived home after sundown and I left my car headlights on to open the door to my house. We could hear my dog barking and coming toward us when he chased what I at first thought was a man. When it came around the trees, we could see it was dark brown, covered with fur, and running towards the car, which we were still in. It then veered and ran back into the woods, still followed by our dog. It looked to me to be more of a youth than a full-grown. My home was in the back of a field surrounded by trees. There is also a creek very nearby. Follow-up investigative report. I spoke with the reporting witness, E.D., by phone for about 40 minutes. E.D. could not get more specific regarding the date of the sighting than what she originally indicated. It was sometime between December of 1997 and the following March. She did remember that it was very cold. E.D. and her husband had just returned home with their three young children. The home was located in a rural part of Oklahoma between Coyle and Stillwater. Area residents commonly kept livestock. The nearest neighbor lived a quarter of a mile away. E.D. and her family resided in a trailer sitting at the back of a pasture. A very large cedar grew near the trailer its branches were described as going all the way down to the ground, the typical growth form. A heavily wooded creek ran behind the trailer. 
The creek joins the Cimarron River, a tributary of the Arkansas River. The rivers meet west of Tulsa, a distance of about 40 miles. As was their custom when arriving home after dark, Edie's husband got out of the car to unlock the trailer's entrance while she stayed with the car. She was the driver, waiting to turn off the headlights. As the family prepared to leave the vehicle, they could hear their dog barking and crashing through the vegetation near the creek. At that time, the dog, a pit bull and boxer mix, was less than one year old. Edie described it as a big pup. The sound of the dog's barking drew nearer. Edie said she hesitated in exiting the vehicle because she could hear something coming. Suddenly, the dog and an upright creature burst from behind the cedar and into the headlights of the car. It approached within 25 feet of the family before turning quickly and running away, this time on the other side of the cedar. Max, the dog, was right on the creature's heels. The family watched it disappear into the darkness, then they retreated, terrified, into the vehicle. The creature was in their sight for about four seconds, and it was fully illuminated by the headlights for about half that time. No one noticed any unusual vocalizations. E.D. said Max came right back. E.D. could not get anyone to come to the property to check things out. Greatly concerned for the safety of her children, she no longer allowed them to play outside. The encounter caused the family to move shortly thereafter. Like most people, E.D. was aware of Sasquatches and identified the creature in her yard as one, but she thought the animals only lived in the Pacific Northwest. Fearing ridicule, she and her husband kept the sighting to themselves for two years. When news reports concerning a Bigfoot sighting in southeastern Oklahoma came to their attention last winter, January of 2000, the decision was made to tell the story. E.D. went to the internet, checked out several Bigfoot-related sites, and submitted a report to the BFRO. There are several aspects to this report that I find interesting. The number of witnesses, four. The size of the animal, and the pursuit by a dog. I don't know the national average for the number of witnesses per sighting, but I would guess it is only slightly greater than one. The older two children in this case were not interviewed, but I did speak to the husband and wife. This situation naturally creates a more comfortable environment for the witnesses and the investigator. Edie mentioned in her submission that the animal seemed young. I asked her several questions about that trying to get a more specific picture of what she saw. She described it as about five feet tall. Arriving at this estimate, by comparing it to herself, it was quite close, if only briefly, and E.D., who is five and a half feet tall, said it appeared to be a little shorter than she, thus the guess as to its height. I also asked her about its build. This was more difficult to quantify. She said it was not thin, and it was not huge. Finally, she described it as having bulk. She did not recall seeing any muscle definition. The animal ran swiftly. One of the things that impressed E.D. was the way it held its arms out from its body, bent at the elbow pointing down as it ran. She thought perhaps this assisted its balance as it made the sudden turn after entering the glare of the headlights. The fact that it had an obvious bend in its arms at the elbow implies to me that it was also bent over at the waist, even though E.D. did not specifically offer that observation during our first conversation. I suggest this because of the way she said the hands and forearms were angled toward the ground. The only other way to achieve this position of the arms would be to rotate the shoulders forward, which is not a natural running position. This also suggests the possibility that the standing height of the animal was at least a few inches more than the estimated five feet. I asked E.D. if what she and her family observed could have been a kid wearing some kind of hooded winter clothing. She stated emphatically that they could clearly see that it was covered with thick hair. The hair on the arms, while not long, could be seen hanging down as it turned. She said the hair was so thick 
appearing thicker even than a gorilla's, that it looked furry. The hair color was described as dark brown with a slight reddish cast. The pursuit of a Sasquatch by a dog is also unusual. Most dogs are reported to be frightened of the creatures, especially when they are close to each other. I can only speculate that the dog was too young to know any better, and the Sasquatch was too small to scare the dog, and or too inexperienced to know how to deal with the situation. It is natural to wonder why the Sasquatch was there in the first place. Possibly it was simply wandering through the region. My guess is that it was looking for food, although people living in the country often have typical barnyard type animals around. I doubt the creature seen by E.D. and her family posed much of a threat to livestock. The family also kept a garden, but nothing would have been available to pilfer in midwinter. Perhaps the animal was seeking to supplement its diet with garbage. This area of the state does not have trash service. Residents have to burn their garbage. A large hole dug in the ground often serves as a container for trash and wastes of all kinds, including food. About once a week, E.D. said, the garbage is burned. This is the procedure followed by many families in that area. It's at least conceivable that a sparsely populated agricultural area with plenty of water, dense cover, and abundant small game could offer a juvenile Sasquatch a suitable temporary home, especially when food scraps are routinely made available. Although extremely nervous about talking to anyone regarding what she and her family experienced, I found E.D. to be completely credible. <laughs>